Bloch's theorem is a general statement about the shape and symmetry of the wave function of electrons in a periodic potential, such as in crystalline solids. Its importance in modern materials science cannot easily be overstated. Among many other things, Bloch's theorem unravels the subtleties of the electronic behavior in solids, such as why electrons can travel large distances in a crystal lattice, much longer than interatomic spacing, without scattering. It unavoidably leads to the important concept of band structure, and to the explanation of why some materials are good conductors while others are insulators or semiconductors. In this video, we're going to go through the basics of Bloch's theorem, explaining why it is the case and its implications to the behavior of electrons in crystalline materials. We will begin by discussing the topic of spatially periodic potentials and periodic boundary conditions for the wave function of electrons. Next, we're going to state Bloch's theorem and prove it by directly solving the time-independent Schrödinger equation in a periodic potential. This video sets the stage for our upcoming discussion on band theory of solids. Let's get started. We begin by analyzing the periodic potential in a crystal. The regularly distributed ions making up the crystal lattice exert Coulomb attraction on the valence electrons. Hence, electrons traveling through a crystal are subjected to a spatially periodic potential. The figure above shows an example of periodic potential with period A, the lattice constant, for a hypothetical one-dimensional crystal that we are going to assume throughout the video to simplify the analysis. Notice that the full potential inherits the lattice periodicity. Mathematically, the periodicity of the potential is captured by the following equation. Which says that the potential landscape is the same if view from the perspective of any each unit cell. Distinct unit cells are connected through the lattice vector R, which is simply an integer n times the lattice constant A in our one-dimensional lattice model. Because the potential is periodic, it can be Fourier transformed as The Fourier coefficients depends on a discrete set of points g, the reciprocal lattice vectors. Note that the reciprocal lattice vectors are inversely proportional to lattice constant A. Hence, the larger is the spacing between lattice points in real space, the smaller is the spacing of reciprocal lattice points in momentum space. In analyzing the wave function of electrons in a periodic potential, it is convenient to employ periodic boundary conditions. The main idea is to focus our analysis in a sufficiently large, but finite, region of space. Because the system is assumed to be homogeneous over macroscopically large distances, much larger than the lattice constant, the wave function can be assumed to be periodic with a large spatial period. This is depicted in the figure above, where the large wave function period, containing several crystal unit cells, is L. Thus, the periodic boundary condition for the wave function reads, where n is the total number of unit cells within the large space region L. Similar to the periodic potential case, the wave function can also be Fourier transformed to momentum space due to the real space periodicity over large distances. The Fourier transform of the wave function is shown here in the green box, where the set of momenta k are now related to the spatial extent of the region L over a large number of unit cells n. Once defined and discussed periodic potentials and periodic boundary conditions for the wave function, we are now in position to state Bloch's theorem. The eigenstates of electrons in a spatially periodic potentials is a product of two pieces. The first piece is a plane wave characterized by a state index k. The second piece is a spatially varying amplitude function u that depends on two quantum state indexes, n and k. Hence, Electrons travel in a periodic potential as plane waves with spatially varying amplitudes. Bloch's insight solves the important question of why not all crystalline materials are not very resistive, with electrons colliding every few angstroms, the typical spacing between ions composing the crystal. Instead, electrons travel effectively as plane wave and crystal as if in vacuum. Electrons in crystals are only scattered, for example, by defects or impurities in the crystal lattice, not by the lattice itself. Because, impurities and defects are much more space than the ions in crystals, electrons can travel much farther than what one would think. The amplitude function has an extra important feature. It is a periodic function with the same periodicity of the lattice, as stated in the green box. 
This function is commonly called the cell periodic part of the eigenstate. The full eigenstate, in the yellow box, is often called a block state after Felix Bloch who derived this important result in his thesis. As eigenstates of the Schrödinger equation, the block states form a complete basis set to expand the full wave function of electrons in a crystal. In Ket notation, the orthogonality and completeness relation of block states are highlighted in green boxes. In the following, we proceed with the proof of Bloch's theorem. The proof of Bloch's theorem can be proven in distinct ways. Here, we are going to prove it by rewriting the Schrödinger equation in momentum space. This approach, enable us to dive deeper into the subtleties of Bloch's ideas and establishes a practical method for calculating electronic states in crystals. Here, we have the Schrödinger equation in real space representation. The kinetic energy term involves the second derivative of the wave function. Substituting the wave function psi of x by its Fourier expansion, we obtain the following identity. Where the second order derivative only acts in the exponential factor of the Fourier expansion producing a minus k squared term. The second term involves the product of the periodic potential and the electronic wave function. Substituting the Fourier expansion of both terms, we obtain the following identity. Notice that the double summation corresponds to the Fourier transforms of the potential and the wave function. As such, they go over different momenta. The summation from the Fourier transform of the periodic potential includes only reciprocal lattice vectors, while the summation from the wave function goes over all momenta defined as to satisfy the periodic boundary conditions. It is convenient to measure all momenta k in relation to reciprocal lattice vectors g. This can be done by shifting the momenta k to k minus g in the double summation. Rendering the final expression for the second term of the Schrödinger equation. The last term, on the right-hand side of the equation, is straightforward. It is just a constant times the wave function. This is what we obtain when replacing the wave function by its Fourier expansion. We now have all ingredient to write the full Schrödinger equation for electrons and periodic potentials in momentum space. The full Schrödinger equation for the problem, shown in the yellow box, can now be rewritten in momentum space as shown. Notice that there is a momentum space Schrödinger equation for each value of k. That is, the momentum k is a label for each particular solution of the equation in the blue box. Hence, the momentum k is a state index for the wave function in a periodic potential. Each one of these momentum space Schrödinger equations tell us that the wave function for a given momentum k is coupled through the Fourier component of the periodic potential to wave functions with momentum differing from k by a reciprocal lattice vector g. This feature is a hallmark of electron behavior in periodic potentials is central to the derivation of Bloch's theorem. Notice that the momentum space Schrödinger equation for each k is not in the eigenvalue problem form, as it consists of all the wave function Fourier amplitudes u of k minus g for every reciprocal lattice vector g. Luckily, this expression can be brought to the eigenvalue problem form by rewriting it in terms of matrices. Hence, we obtain the Schrödinger equation in the eigenvalue problem form for each k. Here, the matrices appearing are as follows. Where the Hamiltonian diagonal elements are related to the kinetic energies at momenta differing by distinct reciprocal lattice vectors. The off-diagonal elements are the Fourier transform of periodic potential, connecting distinct reciprocal lattice vectors. The eigenstate is a column vector with elements corresponding to the Fourier amplitudes of the wave function at distinct reciprocal lattice vectors. Finally, the solution of the eigenvalue for each k will render a set of energy eigenvalues and associated eigenstates, which we index by the quantum number n. Hence, the eigenstates of the periodic potential problem is identified through a k-index, the crystal momentum, and a so-called band index n. The term band index will become apparent in upcoming videos. When we show that the set of all eigenvalues E of n and k, give rise to energy bands indexes by the quantum number n. 
Once solved the Schrödinger equation, we now ask the question of what is the eigenstates of electrons in a periodic potential look like in real space. Luckily, the structure of the Schrödinger equation in momentum space enables us to answer this question. As we saw, the quantum state is labeled by two indexes, n and k. We saw that for a given k, only states with momentum differing from k by a reciprocal lattice vector contribute to the final wave function. Hence, the real space wave function for a given n and k is given by the plane wave superposition of all solution whose wave vectors differ from k by a reciprocal lattice vector. This particular form of the eigenstate can be rewritten as this form is obtained by factoring out the exponential of k times x factor in the Fourier expansion. Hence, the eigenstates are plane wave-like with a spatially varying amplitude, u of x. The amplitude function is as shown, where one can easily check that it has the same periodicity of the periodic potential. That is, the amplitude of the eigenstates are the same from each unit cell of the crystal, defined through the lattice vector r. This concludes the proof of Bloch's theorem. This derivation has the advantage of introducing several important concepts, such as the energy eigenvalues. In the following videos, we will elaborate how this observation leads to the concept of band structure of solids. See you in the next video. Stay tuned, and subscribe, so you will be notified of our future episodes.